um, what prompted me or what pushed me or what inspired me into uh, the entrepreneurial avatar was none other than Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam was asking where he, you know, we happened to connect up with him through some common friends and I was inspired by a 20, 25 minute interaction with him. And that's when he said, we have to aspire to build India 2020. Yeah. Okay. As you put it very rightly, even forget internet, even PC penetration was very pretty low. That's when I founded uh, my first startup with a couple of friends from I am Calcutta uh, called uh, the egurukul.com. Okay. The core mission Okay, or with, there was just one objective that there must be the death of distance in education. Okay, why shouldn't the services of a best teacher be available to everybody beyond geographical barriers, beyond the barriers of time and distance? Okay, that was one core statement of purpose, I would say, with which we started this and uh, 20 years. Businesses have changed, business models have changed, but I guess the core purpose still stands the same. So thank you, Swami. That was a very uh, interesting uh, uh, turn of the clock back to history. Thank you, Swami. Yes. Uh, as far as management and education is concerned, Swami, you've been somebody who has uh, promoted the idea of online management education, especially through your uh, My B School that you uh, you know, founded. So why do you think online management education uh, is the way forward in India, even globally? Most of you might have heard of this uh, very popular uh, terminology called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Even before this terminology came into, the biggest problem in most of my businesses, I guess, is if I look back, I have been ahead of time in uh, most of the businesses. Yeah. And uh, this terminology was given by uh, the US with the launch of edX and Coursera and all that. But much ahead of that, almost 11, 12 years back, uh, I uh, started up uh, mybschool.com with one core objective. While I said that, uh, you know, the distance uh, and time and distance should not be a barrier, that, that still being the core uh, objective and purpose, uh, mybschool.com came with one larger perspective. In my years of being a manager, an entrepreneur, a startup owner, a CEO, one of the key tasks was finding the right people, okay, with the right skills in helping me manage the business and grow the business. I've always believed one thing that just one person can't make all the magic. Even today in all my startups, I always look for people with the right skill sets. So many people whom I started interviewing, I'm sure my other panelists would agree, I'm sure uh, other managers who are listening to this would agree. In most of these interviews, so-called interviews, eight out of 10 used to be an engineer and six out of the 10 should be, would be an engineer with an MBA, all right? I asked him, what did you study? He would say marketing and HR. Marketing, where did you learn from? Uh, college only, sir. I said, yes, but which book did you do? They would say Philip Kotler. Okay. Not here. Go to Stanford, go to Wharton, go to IAM. Philip Kotler is the Bible for marketing. If everybody reads from the same book, shouldn't all of them be equally placeable in the market? So the book didn't make the difference. The analogy that I use here is the rice is the same. Who cooks it makes how tasty the food is. So it was not about the Philip Kotler's book that made a difference to the student, but what actually made the difference was the teacher, the professor who was teaching, the kind of examples that he used, the kind of application that he used to make it relevant to the current business scenario, the current business context, and how well he was able to uh, connect it to real world business problems. So rather than reading theory, how far you do application. We were the first one to introduce a co-branded course with IIM Ranchi way back in the year 2010, I guess, where we gave a mini MBA free of cost. All those who don't have a formal management qualification can take up this course with five core management subjects free of cost. 
all video lessons delivered by top notch professors from the iims okay retired from iims from stanford you 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 name uh, the university they were there it is not that the entire marketing is taken by one person okay product management is taken by different person advertising is taken by different person plus we had people from the industry coming and talking about it that's how we built the content and we had about 1.8 lakh uh, students registering for this course in a very short span of about 7 months and our revenue model is the course is free but you want a certificate you pay 99 dollars okay dollar was about 50 52 rupees then so that was about 5000 bucks okay you pay for a certificate that was a grand success okay and then the americas named it books and they took over the entire thing by storm right okay yeah. so management yeah. education is still the key for any aspiring manager any aspiring entrepreneur but just because he is not able to afford or access a good institution that should not deprive him of a good quality learning that was the purpose of mybschool.com very interesting so reaching the you know be able to give the bulk of the population a chance to you know be educated in the management Absolutely. side and Absolutely. experience it that that was that's very inspiring in fact i'm just reading a quote from uh, john hersey who says learning starts with failure the first failure is the beginning of education so uh, i think a lot of this combined with the practical application of uh, you know what they've learned like you said the application is where the difference is Uh, so that's very interesting. So, uh, Swami, we we have seen massive investments come in globally in the area of fintech. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of investment that's coming into edtech, and you being one of the early birds in the area of edtech, where do you see the edtech, or where, what is the future of edtech in India likely to be in the next five years? Where do you see it going? Last twenty years. i if i'm able to count it quickly about a dozen startups uh, except one the rest of it 13 i mean a dozen about 10 no, 12 of them in the edtech space yeah uh seven of them shut down okay yeah. as you said learning starts with failure there's been a lot of learning there yeah, seven of them shut down uh three of them sold with a 17x to a 70x returns more of it went to my investors rather than what i made yeah and two of it i'm still running okay i'm still learning every day is a learning process just the only thing that we do is we ensure that we don't make the same mistakes that we did earlier okay it's not just about edtech fintech or you know whatever any business if you know answers to five questions i think you're a success i run an initiative called startup to scale up where i help a lot of uh, uh, startup entrepreneurs uh, okay in helping them right from you know product structuring to business modeling to whatever with one core purpose that they need not make the same mistakes that i did okay these are the five questions that i ask so you were asking me about edtech but i'm saying it in a larger uh, context what problem are we solving that's the prospective customer want to solve that problem three is he willing to pay the money we are asking for to solve that problem and are there enough number of people who will keep paying time and again to solve that problem if you have a clear yes for this yes you have a business if you don't please take it from me it's just a hobby don't consider it as a business given that context why is edtech growing at this point of time the adoption of e learning in the last 20 years right from the time i founded egurukul.com the rate of adoption has been the highest in the last 5 months time okay yeah only now i actually see e learning and online learning picking up yeah Re revenues are voluntarily coming in now yeah so it's a good time if you can solve good problems okay yeah. one big problem that i see the whole world has adopted to zoom or similar platforms in the last 5 months right. training and teaching has happened but how are they going to test and assess the students is a big question mark right. if there can be low cost credible platforms that can actually monitor students during the process i, I see a huge opportunity and a very big adoption 
ed tech is here to grow education as a business we call it the recession free business okay so that being probably, the case, yeah probably he- probably health would also be in that category i suppose absolutely that, yeah. health is mostly covered by insurance by most of the big uh, countries and even in countries like india with prime ministers and chief ministers insurance schemes they are all getting covered so somebody else is paying but education it is the parent who pays he would love to first spend on education for the child and then look at other expenditures so edtech is all set to grow further and this is not a bubble that you are seeing you will sustain this wave you will be able to deliver value if you are solving problems consistently and not creating problems yeah. very interesting uh, swami that's a very interesting one yes uh, you you mentioned the fact that a lot of change has happened in the last 5 months in the area of school education college education every form of education so post covid that is once we recover from uh, the virus or we have a solution for the virus uh, and things get back to the new normal as we call it what are the what are the changes that are there to stay the things that we see now is going to probably going to stay even after we recover from uh, you know the this virus and the impact of it number 1 <clears throat> you cannot do without the physical school or the college yeah learning or education is not just about following a curriculum and taking some exams and getting a certificate an sslc or a higher secondary or a college degree learning is also about collaboration about team building about interaction with uh, even student peers playing hitting each other you know i mean learning is all about that so i don't think that aspect can ever be done away with but what is very likely to happen is that with the national education policy kind of thing you know being implemented in a country like india i'm talking with a more um, indian context here if india itself is going to adopt to that i'm sure that the world is as well going to follow or rather you know we would follow the world in that trend the model of flipped classrooms will become predominant what does flipped classroom mean there would be online lessons where the theory is learnt at home on a tab or a online you know in whatever format in a digital format and you come to class to discuss problems and uh, uh, application flipped classrooms very interesting uh, swami yeah so you learn at home the concepts and the theory you come to class to discuss applications all lower order thinking happens at home and all higher order thinking happens in the classroom so that's how I, i i see a trend evolving over the next uh, uh, five years or so right uh swami uh looking at the other side of the coin according to you i think you did mention a couple of things but according to you what are the limitations of online education virtual classes and so on uh since we've spoken a lot about the positive aspects i'm sure you want to also tell us what you think are the practical limitations of online learning virtual learning and so on. one simple thing see right now i can see about 36 people in this particular uh, learning process that is happening here okay right. unfortunately we are not able to see all of us yeah bandwidth is going to be one key issue all right right physical interaction is going to be another third while you and i are talking we don't know how many are actually attending to us how many of them are doing something else how many of them are saying oh wow what a boring session this is or how many of them are saying wow is it interesting we don't know these are all the potential pitfalls so it can never be online it has to be a blended learning format yeah so these are the pitfalls of uh, pure play uh, digital uh, learning remote learning yeah. is coming in uh, no face to face connect i think that was mentioned very good uh, kalpesh aban says children in villages and uh, government schools are deprived of this uh, opportunity of education very nice uh these are some very interesting uh, limitations that we feel uh good points very very nice very nice okay so it's time now to move to the next aspect of this particular learning which is the content aspect the content perspective and this is where we would like to introduce you to our second speaker and our second speaker is monica nayar she is joining in from pune monica nayar has a career spanning over two decades with close to 10 years in the field of learning as a facilitator and also as an author that uh, monica has got is a best teacher award for skill development 
given by the Leela Punawala Foundation in 2017-18. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things. The other thing that uh, we have on the screen uh, are some books where Monica has actually co-authored and written a few chapters. So uh, Monica, you, you, you also write a lot of blogs as well. We know that you write a lot of blogs as well and uh, you've contributed to proper books as well. As far as uh, the professional uh, facilitation is concerned, Monica has worked with some of the top banks in the country, some leading insurance companies. And to be specific, some of the companies that she actually has uh, worked with are Post Motors, Hista Yale, Fiat, Asian Paints, and Amazon India, just to name a few. So Monica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. How are you doing? Very well, thank you so much. How about everybody? Yeah, we're, we're doing good, uh, Monica. Thank That's you. That's great. Right. So uh, from the first speaker, we had a lot of uh, exposure to the area of online education uh, from a school college perspective, also from the management perspective. That's so right. uh, Monica, uh, since you're involved a lot in content development as well, along with facilitation, we'd like to see the content aspect and how things are going to change from that perspective. Right. So right. my first question to you, Monica, is you see there is a shift from a facilitator driven training, uh, education, to more of a content-driven uh, training, facilitation, education, and so on. So what are your thoughts on this, Monica, this shift? Um, well, uh, I think that uh, um, specifically looking at the last few months, the way online, and uh, you know, I also heard uh, my previous speaker speak, Swami spoke wonderfully about the changes that have happened. I think that right now we are at a place that it's neither facilitator driven really, nor content driven really, but it is more flexibility driven um, uh, work that we are doing. As far as the content goes, uh, I believe in my experience in the last six months I would, or seven months, I would, I would definitely say that um, it has become, uh, uh, you know, uh, learners right now need, need a keto diet, so to speak. So they don't need a lot of carbohydrates and they don't need a lot of fatty um, uh, learning. So we want to give them bite-sized learning which are, which are more doable, which are more actionable in nature. So what used to happen in a classroom is that because we also had higher number of, you know, larger number, duration was really, really high. So we would go into a classroom and we would spend about eight to nine hours with the learners, which is not the case in online. Uh, because at max, I have gotten four hours. So recently I did a project with an IT company and we got like four hours, uh, you, know, you know, learning duration. And those four hours actually tired the learners. So we realized that we wanted to reduce the number of hours while making sure that value is given. Because each of them wants something which is doable, something which is implementable. Because the world is filled with a lot of gyan. So I feel that uh, we have uh, we have to make as as um, absolutely so we have to make sure that the learning is very flexible because I want to make sure that the learners are with me. What is in it for them actually gets answered. That's one. At the same time, I want to make sure that the organizational objective is maintained. So I have to also keep that in mind. So very very flexible, but definitely a sort of a keto diet uh, for for learners to make sure that they get all the nutrition that they want from us, but uh, without um, any added additional concepts. So more doable and more relatable, actionable learning. That would be my take from the content development. Yes, uh, Monica, you did say that your learners were tired at the end of four hours. Uh, I want to ask you if you were tired at the end of four hours. I, I, am, I am poor. I have unlimited energy, so I don't get tired at all. I okay really love my job and uh, <laughs> I don't get that. <laughs> okay, so uh, moving on to the next question, Monica. From a content perspective, what do you think needs immediate change? I think you did start off with that, but from a content perspective, what are the things that you see changing immediately? Um, um, I definitely feel, uh, especially if I, if I talk about the millennials as, as we were discussing, uh, that because of the advent, not just of social media, but also with initiatives that Swami and other, other edupreneurs have taken, that these newer generation actually know a lot of stuff that we have been teaching. So just, just, just last week, I was conducting this workshop with newcomers and they're like, hey, you know, we know that concept very, very well. And they're like, okay, 
Uh, so it uh, we need to really look at newer ways of explaining the same concept like i said more relatable and more doable so when i when when even people that i'm in touch with are developing content they are making sure we are making sure that because it is online it is definitely visually appealing because if you're staring at the screen you might as well make their time work so we want to make sure that that it is really really visually appealing also to make sure that uh, 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 that we have enough quizzes we have enough stories to make sure that even though they are tired they're not really really you know um, uh, tired so i think that uh, some of the some of the changes that facilitators and content developers will have to do is to make sure that uh, you know they make the content in such a manner that the learners don't get really tired tired per se right so i think you've actually uh, answered part of the next question which is about how do you engage the millennials and the gen z uh, with content. So, uh, any other specific points would you like to share there? Yes. I, I also think that, and I agree with what uh, Swami had said, uh, the flipped classroom. He said that they, they in the classroom, they um, at home or wherever they are doing self-learning, they discuss the, 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 the lower level and higher level of learning happens in the classroom. We call it in the whole, in the whole instructional design, we call this the user-generated content. And um, it will be a great idea uh, to, to make your learners actually do the learning and present it to the facilitator, where a facilitator just actually ties the, the loop, uh, you know, the, the loose ends. So when, um, and uh, this is something, um, you know, like, like we all discussed that Zoom is a great platform because it also has breakout rooms. It gives a facilitator an opportunity to break people into team where they actually get to talk to each other and interact with each other. Whereas Swami said that, you know, they want to get, you know, um, give a high five to each other, that may not necessarily happen in a breakout room, but a lot of interaction can take place. So user generated, generated content actually means that they discuss in their respective groups, come back and present, because it gives them an opportunity to also speak and interact with the facilitator, while facilitator can just, you know, tie all the loose ends. So I would highly recommend uh, facilitators um, and people who are in the learning space to, to really utilize the power of user-generated content. Second, definitely we spoke about the whole visually appealing aspect and introduction of multimedia quizzes and, and, and stories. But I think um, there is one power which has not been really utilized, which is the power of memes and the power of Fun stuff that is happening in social media. How many of sure you agree I... with that? How many of you agree with that? <laughs> Memes being uh, a way of teaching, I think. It's, uh, uh, how many of you people think that, you know, memes and all these kind of, uh, 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 you know, sarcastic, dramatic, intellectual thoughts spread by these pictures and a few words, uh, you know, actually does that? Yes, please. Yes. So um, I have been, I have been using memes um, uh, for the longest time without even realizing that they were memes. But uh, uh, when I recently joined Instagram, I found I found that there were so many memes and they were so relatable. The recent wave, I'm not sure how many of you know, but Rasode Me Kaun Tha, you know, that whole meme um, made a topic that I was facilitating on questioning skills um, very, very easy for me. So I think when, when specifically looking at millennials, because they really use social media and they're aware of what is happening around what memes or what, what jokes are being created around, it makes very relatable for them to understand. So I don't need to take a big concept of a Thomas Kilman model or a really high fi I want to make it relatable for them. So that, that helps for them to be really able to collect what I'm, what I'm talking. So it does two things. One, it makes the learning relatable. And second, it makes a facilitator's job really easy. Because as per Robert Cialdini's principle of, of influence, he said that the easiest way you can influence anybody is by being likable. And when I speak the same language as them, I become likable immediately. So the ice breaking can take place, which means at least in my opinion that has uh, that has happened um, Fantastic. Uh, in, in fact some of the uh, members of the order view or the audience 
is actually saying one member among says that you know memes is something that has to be done, it has to be a part of the you know the education and so on. A lot of people agreeing with you as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, secondly, I think that uh, so far the way learning has happened, the aspect of realism uh, is ha has been the same. And the reason that I actually got into this field after spending 14 long years, um, you know, in the telecom full-time job was only to make make sure that uh, there is a certain aspect of uh, aspect of realism. While I completely agree with uh, a message that just came in from Mr. Ramamurthy that uh, uh, all the learners know, definitely not, because you need to know the meme to be able to, be able to relate, which is why I said that specifically for millennials, because they're on social media, social media is filled with memes. So I think that part uh, is, is something um, for millennials, definitely in my experience that has been successful. So an aspect of realism, making sure that uh, they, it is something which is relatable, actionable, and doable. Because many times they say, Ye hume pata hai. this is something that we know. Tell us what we can do with this. So I also have noticed that millennials are action-oriented. They want to do, they have this energy to do it. So yes, aspect of realism and making sure that it is fun and relatable would be my answer so I'll to your question. So uh, there's been a lot of thought, even on this debate about, uh, you know, even on this show about how the company is facilitating, you know, learning, facilitators, you know, lecturers, teachers, what they should be doing and how to improve learning. But let's look at the other side of the coin as well, which is what do learners have to do to make sure that their learning is effective? You know, there, there's a saying which says that you can take a horse to water, but Ultimately, you know, the horse is going to make the decision uh, to drink the water. So what do you think the learners need to do while using the online model uh, to increase their effectiveness? Um, I, I think I'd like to answer this in two parts. One, definitely everybody has to shed this sort of inhibition uh, or that hesitation that online learning or a myth that online learning is not effective. Definitely, it is not as effective as a classroom because there I can reach out to people, I can have a conversation, I can have a side conversation, I can do a lot of network building. That doesn't happen on an online. But this is all that, that we got. So we have to make make do with what is available. So I, I think every learner uh, would, you know, I request them to drop inhibition that they might have. Um, um, that online learning is effective. That would be one. Second, definitely keep an open, open mind. Uh, Create a, a space um, where learning is conducive. Make sure that you're on video. Make sure that you're actually participating. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, just, just ask questions and just be ready for learning. I think that is definitely something that, uh, that a learner uh, you know, should, should, should look at because this is all we have. So we'll make best use of what is available. Right. So uh, one quick question, Monica. Right, the last quick, quick question is, um, is the facilitator, is the teacher, is the lecturer, the professor still going to be important and relevant in the coming years? A seed sown still needs water and fertilizer and still needs weeds, st weeds are still need weeds. Somebody needs to still remove the weeds. So I think the role of a teacher, mentor, facilitator, guide, uh, is going to be always there because without it, we all need, uh, you know, people to tell us that whether we are thinking, whatever we're thinking, is that the right thought and how do I actually apply it? So I think that uh, uh, facilitators or is a is facilitator's role is pretty much like that of a farmer. Uh, you can, you know, sow a seed, but definitely needs to be uh, nourished. Right. So, so you're strongly voting for the maybe they need to change their approach and be more relevant to stay under track. So Absolutely. that's what you're trying to say as well. So, uh, right. Thank you, Monica. That was fantastic. Uh, we come come back in terms you, of yeah. online education. Uh, but uh, Balamurthy says that online education has been on for the last three months, but it's not been that effective uh, due to the limitations of people having connectivity, mobile phones, tablets, and so on. But you still have the opportunity to do some form of studies to make sure that you can complete the syllabus. I think that's one of the advantages. Uh, Aman Pandey says that, you know, they can use their spare time at home developing other skills, life skills and so on. So uh, these are some brilliant answers, brilliant answers. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, and also an opportunity to uh, keep the child occupied as well. So these are some very good uh, positives and there are some challenges as well. Right. Uh, on that note, let's move on to the third speaker for today. And uh, the third speaker for today is Kachi Okizi, a management consultant from the UK. Hi, Kachi. Nice, uh, nice to have you on our show. That is brilliant. It's great to, to, to be with you today. And uh, it's been a fantastic conversation from what I've heard from my from the, from the two previous speakers. Thank you, thank you. So let me formally introduce Kachi to the audience here. So Kachi Okizi is a management consultant from the UK, and he has a wealth of experience in management, strategy, law, public policy, compliance, and training. He founded CTP International in 2005 in South Wales, United Kingdom. Now, CTP International operates in Dubai and Nigeria as well, and has prestigious clients in Nigeria, like the Central Bank of Nigeria, FRCN or Radio Nigeria, Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, and Corporate Affairs Commission um, of Nigeria as well, just to name a few. He is also the senior partner at Pembroke Solicitors in the United Kingdom. Kachi is a lawyer by profession, and he's called Barrister Kachi Okizi in his close circles. He also has a diploma in journalism and an MBA from the University of Wales, Newport. Uh, Kachi has been a commentator on several topics in management and in politics. You can see a few uh, screenshots of him. The first I'm one being the one time, time. Kachi, uh, we would like to get your views on the organizational perspective. Now, we've had a lot of emphasis in the first two speakers in terms of the individual perspective. And here we're going to look more in terms of the organizational uh, perspective. Yes. And my first question, uh, Kachi, to you is, what kind of changes do you see in terms of organizational strategies towards learning, especially post-COVID and with the kind of events that we're having right now? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Always a delight to uh, participate in your programs and to interact with you I, I i have i have observed a couple of uh, trends i was very interested in what the uh, earlier speaker said the the gentleman um that runs oh, no. the management institute yes from yeah um you yourself uh swap you said something you said when is it? When are we going to go into the new normal? When all of this is over, and I have heard this from a few clients of mine in consulting, and my quick answer to them is: just disabuse your mind of that. This is the new normal. Get used to it. You know, as human beings. We always tend to hold on to what we know and our comfort zones. It's difficult to shift. And so the, the, the whole idea that this is a passing phase is very difficult for some people to get rid of. It is not a passing phase. Yes, we will return to, and we are already returning to some kind of uh, what we used to call normal. But there has been a major shift without a doubt. There has been a major shift. There are things that are here to stay. So I think for anybody, any organization designing its learning strategy, you know, it needs to really develop the attitude of capturing the now as the now. Today uh, is what it is. We have to address the issues of today. And what are those issues of today? I'll give you a little example. There's some research, uh, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, I think it was 2018, that I picked up in my travels somehow. Uh, it's the Forceway Research, F-O-S-W-A-Y. It's a big learning uh, development organization, they're consultants, based in the UK. In, two, in 2018, they did a study, and they asked the, um, it was a study of L&D managers, heads of department, you know, in different organizations. And they asked them, where are you in your journey 
with the digital transformation of learning. Where are you in your journey? Where is, that, where is your organization on that journey? 4% of those who responded said they, they had finished. It was completed. Our plans are finished. This is it. Just 4%. 69% Sixty-nine percent said their plans were still under development. It was still in progress. Twenty-three percent said they were still in the finalizing stage. But the rest of them said it wasn't relevant to their business. So, unlike to their business, in 2020, about June 2020, they repeated this study. In the repeat of that study, the same question was put to them. Where are you or where is your organization in your journey with the digital transformation of learning? Now listen to it this time. 15%, it was four before. Now 15% said they had completed. That is an increase of 11%. 76% said they were still in progress. That is up 7%. 9% said they were in the planning phase. That is down 14%. But most significantly, 0% said it was not relevant to them. Wow. So you ask yourself, all of a sudden, what changed their minds? What is it that made them suddenly embrace online learning? What is it that made them suddenly prioritize it as a strategic priority for them? It's called COVID-19. That's what. So that's what did it for them. COVID has disrupted that system, that thinking, that mindset. That, you know, this is not for us. Uh, it's what other people do. It's not relevant to us. And so the, the question now is, clearly, changes have happened. I was very impressed with the concept that the other speaker, uh, I think it's me, uh, shared about the flipped classroom. Yes, the flipped classroom. Now, I, I've been involved in some work in the UK on blended learning. The CIPD is a leader in that area, without a doubt. And they've been preaching this long before COVID came. Now, everybody is seeking to understand how that works. For businesses, um, what we pick up, particularly in this part of the world, I'm, I'm currently in Nigeria. I, I shuffle between Nigeria and the UK. The culture, I believe, also plays a role. The culture shapes the strategy to a large extent. Um, digital transformation of all processes, not just learning, of all processes, will involve a mandatory shift in culture. And once you have that shift in culture, people think and do things the way that the current uh, uh, situation makes imperative for them. So it's going to happen. But... Then the issue arises, what are the realities of this transformation, practically speaking? It's easy for a small business located in the UK, supported by government when, when support is needed, to um, enjoy the luxury of that support in making the trans, you know, transition. But in other jurisdictions, that may not be the case. So what becomes a priority for a small business in terms of how they learn may not necessarily reflect what we just illustrated. In Nigeria, for example, in the public sector, the, the reason why people learn in their organization tends to differ from what happens in the private sector. The private sector is all about the bare bones learning. We have to go get the knowledge, go get, you know, uh, um, whatever we can get away with. You know, we need to pay, uh, stretch our, our money, our dollar, as far as it can go. In the public sector, it's slightly different. In fact, it's very different. 
It's more about the holistic development of the human being, not just the skill set that you're looking for. They're looking for that exposure. They're looking to take their organization's name across borders, make contacts, network, you know, and, and build relationships across the borders that way. So the imperatives are slightly different. And for that reason, I'm able to predict that the response, the strategy, uh, the strategic response is also going to be different. Now, in terms of moving to online delivery, the pickup rate in the private sector appears almost natural, seamless. Whereas in the public sector, first of all, there's been a reluctance to accept the reality for, I'd say for about six months, it's been a question of, yeah, it, it, let's wait till this comes to pass. It, it, it will all pass. It may not. Uh, and so the, the private sector is responding much faster. So when you ask about the strategies that organizations are deploying, I think culture plays a key part. And these, these, these are priorities in terms of the imperative that they have also will play a key role. There are barriers and there are challenges as well. So I think culture, uh, the type of sector, and these are kind of things that factors that play a huge role in just reiterating That's on right. what you That's right. said, right? So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, very interesting, Kachi. So let me just quickly uh, give you a statistic. And this is taken from the e-learning industry. It says that in the year 2015, a total of $107 billion was the value of the e-learning market. So in 2015, the e-learning market was 107 billion US dollars. In 2025, it's predicted to reach 325 billion US dollars, basically gonna triple in 10 years. So considering there's gonna be a massive rise in investment and value of the e-learning market, and, you, and since you've worked in different uh, countries and continents, I would say, in the UK and in different parts of Europe, in Africa and Middle East, uh, in the United States, and also, uh, and also conducted and organized programs in India, what do you think is the key here? And uh, where do you see the investment going and how is the market going to work, especially considering that some of the employees are actually going to be in the gig form of uh, you know, employment? Very interesting question. And it's one where you say it's really like anybody's guess. Because when this baseline was done in 2015, uh, it, just like I explained, it was viewed, I, I remember, it was viewed by a lot of people as not very realistic. That was the sort of general attitude that received this uh, um, study. I've seen a similar one, not exactly like this, um, not these same numbers, but I've seen a similar one. But the trends remain the same. Now, in this uh, uh, market that is being forecast, it's not just about the learners, you know, how do you measure the, the output of learning? That is part of it. But a major part of this uh, um, estimate is in the learning infrastructure as well. Much of what you see in these numbers go towards the physical infrastructure, but also the uh, non-physical uh, um, expenditure. Expenditure such as um, content development, software, um, intellectual property, which is a huge cost as well, but also the campaigns, the cost of the messaging about these uh, trends. So it does one thing though, it adds credence, it lends credence to the idea that this is definitely a growth uh, sector, without a doubt. It's a, this is a growth sector. And it's one that I think uh, promises cross application across industries. You see, right now, much of these predictions are based on education alone, whether it's primary, whether it's secondary, whether it's tertiary education. It's based mostly on education. 
But what COVID has done in its unique and rather disruptive manner is to show us that this channel of engagement can be replicated across sectors. All of a sudden, if you can't go to the doctors, but you still need to be seen by a doctor or to consult, that's being done online now. And that wasn't the case. That was completely inconceivable about six years ago, 10 years ago. But that's being done online now. Now, would you call that learning and development or service delivery? So these are the uh, really attractive prospects of uh, uh, um, you know this kind of uh, technological transformation going on in the area of learning, particularly in the uh, you know technology space. So there will be in that uh, uh, estimate that you see there, there will be infrastructure costs. There will be um, intellectual property costs, and there will also be uh, uh, communication and messaging costs. So all of these actually um, show that this industry as well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very interesting, uh, Kashi. Also that we see uh, this learning is not limited to just the typical corporate sectors. The learning has actually moved to areas no. of uh, science and uh, medicine and pharmacology and uh, you know the other sectors as well. There's a massive investment going into these sectors as well in terms of learning. So uh, that's, that's very interesting. So thank you, Kachi. Those were very interesting views, in-depth views of uh, you know what learning is going to look like from an organization, organizational perspective. And it's time for us to engage the audience in a rapid fire Q&A. Uh, so admin, would you like to administer the poll and um, bring uh, the other speakers back on screen for us to then discuss the poll as well. So once the audience are done with the poll, we can, uh, you know, ask the same questions to the panelists and we'll see what kind of answers we get from them as well, right? So let's right. give it, so let's post the questions now to the panelists and let's see what answer yes. they have for the same questions. And then we just try and look at what the statistics from the audience poll says. Right. The first question uh, to all the members of the panel. The traditional classroom setup will disappear in five years. The traditional classroom setup will disappear in five years. Uh, Kashi, would you like to go first? Yes or no? I don't think it will disappear. I was, I was, I found that question difficult to answer because right. it's an either or sort of question. It doesn't give you leeway. I don't think it will disappear completely. It will, it will, be, it will still be there, but it will look different, radically different. But it won't disappear. So maybe the I think it will move different. towards uh, one. One will complement the other. Um, I think that technology will enhance the uh, functioning of the classroom. It will not replace it at all. I believe that. Um, I mean, this is why the. I aspire appeal to 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 um, the flipped classroom really appeals to me, and I'm going to. I would like to, you know, discuss this a bit more with you. It's very interesting. So I think that's what's going to happen. The classroom will represent something slightly different to what we've known it to be, but it will not disappear. No, not at all. So Monica, yes or no? Absolutely not. At least if I look at India as a country, I doubt that it will. You know, disappear. But I agree with what Kathy said that um, you know probably in some places uh, it, it it will radically change, but it won't disappear. It's here to stay. Thanks, Monica. Swami, what about you? What's your answer to this? A, a, a school is a building with four walls and a tomorrow inside. Okay. <laughs> it's very difficult for you to do away with a physical classroom. As I said. Children learn give and take, children learn leadership, children learn team building. Yeah, everything right. out there. So it's very unlikely that online would take over. Even in your corporate world today, which I'm sure both uh, my other uh, you know, my colleagues here would agree, uh, a full fledged online training program cannot be as effective as for the exactly. percentages may differ, that's it. But face to face interaction is here to stay. And 
for when you say classroom i think it, you're talking about talking about a typical school or a college in a in a you know i mean classroom in in, in k12 or a higher education uh, uh, scenario and in a corporate it's it's a it's a hotel or it's a boardroom or whatever which i call the classroom is here very much to stay it is not going to disappear not five years even for the next 25 years it's not going to disappear right okay so let's look at the audience response to this 26 percent of the audience have actually said yes that will disappear so uh and and the remaining 68 percent actually said no so i think we are with the audience here right so i'll start the second question with swami again swami uh, yeah. the second question is uh for every dollar that is spent on learning twenty dollars is regained through increased productivity or the roi is twenty dollars on one dollar investment in learning i don't know where you got that formula from okay yeah. one is to <coughs> That's something that I need to, you know, but for every $1 of investment, okay, if you look at it from a typical Indian perspective, with Kachi would be very interested in knowing uh, if there are certain parts of India where if my son does an engineering, this is his market value during marriage. If he does an engineering from an NIT, this is the market value in marriage. And if he is an IITN, this is his market value. Okay. So if that's what you're talking about, one is to twenty, probably yes. But if you're talking about uh, all the three of us being corporate trainers ourselves, I would say every organization aspires to uh, take twenty x of or or whatever number of you know uh, they want to send somebody for a training and they expect them to come back to work and deliver results with the fourth day. You know, three day training, fourth day they want everybody as transformed employees. It doesn't work that way. Learning is a continuous process. And, uh, you know, having said that, you need to, uh, you know, gone are the days when I used to be a corporate trainer 20 years back. Uh, we used to do three day training programs and then slowly it evolved to uh, training and then hand holding in the workspace. And now today people are talking about mentoring, coaching. So it's a lifelong process. So I really do not know, uh, you know, if one is to 20 is right, but at least. A one is to seven or one is to eight in the medium term and one is to ten in the long term is a very good bet yes but definitely for every dollar spent there is a, a higher return expected no doubt about it right uh, thanks swami uh, monica quick yes or no um i don't know if it is going to be 20 i agree with what swami said it's going to be 20 or it's going to be 200 uh, the way i look at it is that it's not going to be return on investment but it, it's going to be return on individuals so uh, uh, you know how learning is a is a continuous process, like Swami Swami says. Are they nurtured? Is there is there a recap happening? Do they have conducive environment where they can display their learnings? Is their culture and environment really supporting them? So it could be twenty, it could be two, it could be two hundred. Really depends upon all these aspects that I just mentioned. Right. Okay. Uh, so Kashi, what's your thought on this? Yes. No. Oh, uh, you know what? I got cut off. I missed part of it. Kindly just sit back the question to me. So, for every dollar spent on learning, you get yes. a return of investment of twenty dollars. Oh so yes, yes, I remember that. I again, very strange equation. I don't know how you got that. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. It's you about re return on investment of uh, about twenty dollars to a dollar, something like that. That's right. Yes. I think it's a, I think it's a little bit fantastic. The audience have actually said, uh, I think close to 85% have actually said yes. So it looks like the learning in some form is here to stay. And other people would like to invest in their, uh, you know, learning in some form. Maybe the I model think... they use would be different. Yeah. If, I, if I'm allowed to reveal how I voted, I'll probably say that I voted yes. yes. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I voted purely on instinct, right. okay. you know, uh, and, and also on, 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 on a sense of, you know, being positive, you know, somebody whose who, who's, uh, glass is half full rather than half empty, you know, it's aspirational. Okay. Yeah, and I think so. I think so. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's not far-fetched. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next question quickly. 
what is the most important factor for the growth of online slash virtual learning? The three factors are convenience, technology, cost. You have to choose one of them quickly. Shall I start with uh, Kachi? Convenience, technology, cost. I think I chose technology because what, uh, as I'm speaking to you now, you know, doing, operating from Nigeria is not the same as operating from the UK. I can tell you that one. Mm -hmm. And the key difference is technology. Whereas there's diffusion of the technology here, everybody's got a mobile phone, everybody's got some kind of device or another. But the challenge is, you know, their, their capability, bandwidth, bandwidth. The infrastructure bandwidth, I think, is probably the biggest challenge to the growth of online learning here. Bandwidth is the problem, so as you can see from our Zoom call. So you're going for technology, yeah? Technology for me, yes. Swami, what about you? Yeah, whatever it costs, we'll pay. We're I happy just, to pay. I didn't recall, I think, uh, Aman Pandey or uh, Mohini Sate, one of them had... Uh, mentioned after my first uh, uh, round that people in villages and remote areas are deprived okay uh, today i would say we are in a world where there is no dearth of technology convenience no doubt about it there is convenience that's why people choose that there is no dearth of technology not that we have to invent anything new but the problem is cost the money that is required to be invested in a remote village in Jharkhand or in a remote village in uh, Africa to get the bandwidth. There is bandwidth available. There is technology available. There are optical fiber cables running down under the sea. But the cost, the money involved in getting them there is the biggest hindrance in the growth of online learning. So you think it's uh, cost is the primary factor, while the other two are important as well. Yeah. Yeah. Monica, what about you? I agree with what Kachi said, and I, I mean, if I'm allowed to re reveal again, I chose technology because I think that's why we have so many platforms. Um, newer platforms are coming in ever since this whole COVID situation came in, right. and everybody started to use that, and prices started to, you know, go up. I, you know, yes, cost is definitely, uh, you know, a thing here, but newer platforms started to, you know, come in, and they started charging for a few months. First few days free, first few weeks free. So they got us into the habit of using their technology. And as soon as we got habituated, they said, bam, now you pay 1700 bucks per month. So, uh, so yeah, both the things are, uh, are definitely important. But if I were to choose, I'd take up technology. Yeah, the audience have voted for convenience being the top factor. Technology comes in second and cost comes in third. Right. So uh, let's quickly finish the last two questions. Uh, the fourth question is, uh, AI-driven learning uh, and online learning will destroy social skills. AI-driven learning slash uh, online learning will destroy social skills. Yes or no question. Let's have a quick yes or no. And uh, first, uh, let's go with Swami. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can say it is artificial intelligence. Your basic emotional intelligence and social intelligence is gone. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Swami. Uh, Kachi, what, what would your quick answer be? No. Um, no. But it's a very difficult no. Yeah, no. It won't. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, Monica, will, it, yeah. it, will, it, will, it will impede. It will impede, but no, yeah. Monica, yours? Uh... No. Like a straight no, because it's just one aspect of, of lo learning. is just one aspect. People will still interact with other people, right, in some form or the other. So I think um, um, they learn with they learn with experience, if not with the learning, with the, with the I, AI. I would definitely differ with the other panelists here. You know why? Right? You look at children today, okay? The kind of screen time that they are spending. I did a, a research during COVID. In Tamil Nadu, 687% increase in screen time, okay? Not learning, okay? But in playing games, okay? In watching Netflix, in watching Peppa Pig, in watching, uh, you know. It's all learning. Uh, yeah. So what happens is in this process, they are glued to a screen and forget to interact with a brother or a, a sister who are there. Okay. If this goes higher and higher, automatically, that's why we all say, you know, don't sit 
like a couch potato and watch the TV. The TV was the first thing that all that made us all stupid. Okay, we we we, we the children have stopped playing outside. <laughs> children have stopped going out and playing. Yeah, because they're so glued to their skill. If you if you keep increasing your artificial intelligence and with that they're going to get in more PUBGs and you know other things in place over a period of time. Social skills are definitely going to come down. That's my perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. Um, on, uh, and I also think that you know carrying forward the same thought that Swami said. I think that way when these 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 very kids will go out in the in the business world or in the world in general, they would have learned what not to do by spending so much time on screen, perhaps. Okay. So uh, think, thank you. Uh, I think Swami, I, I think Swami, you raise an important point, but I, I think it probably, like I said, it will impede uh, the development of social skills. But I don't think it will completely. It's a threat. There's no doubt about it. It's a threat. It is a threat. But what, what can be done? There are, I think that will now get us to think about ways to mitigate that threat. For example, including messages in the games, in the content, including messages that will sort of remind people to take a break and, uh, you know, go and talk to people, go and interact with human beings and all of that. You know, so I think it's a problem, but I think it's one that has a solution as well. 63% have actually said yes. So the last question, in the interest of time, we'll have to have a quick one, just a yes or no for this. The last uh, one that we have is life experience still remains the best teacher. Swami, yes or no? Yes, we're going for a yes, okay? Monica, yes or no? Absolutely yes. 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 Uh, and uh, Kachi, we all uh, final answer on that? Yes. Yes. But at least uh, one thing yes. all the three of us have to agree with the audience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we, have we, 90 we finally agreed on something. Yeah. <laughs> right. We, we have close to 90% of the audience uh, that have actually, uh, you know, uh, agreed with all of the members as well. I think a lot of them are actually chatting, you know, in the chat, supporting some of the audience. So, so, uh, that, so in the interest of time, we will have to uh, bring this session to an end. It was a very interesting debate with panelists with different perspectives uh, from different parts uh, of the country, the world, and their ideas about individual learning and corporate learning, organizational learning. It was a pleasure having all of you. Thank you so much, panelists, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, viewers, for being with us, uh, staying active on chat, giving us some of the key uh, you know, inputs on chat as well. Uh, there are a couple of emails shared there. Any comments, feedback, or anything that you want to share with us, any questions, you can always do that. The emails are being shared there. Uh, any of the videos of the previous episodes, you can always check the YouTube channel with the name for Kesh Sebastian. You can see some of the other episodes as well. Once again, panelists, thank you so much for joining us. It was brilliant having all of you. Uh, and until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Pleasure was ours. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. That's a good way to, you know, get the week ending. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Have a great weekend. Well done, week. Swaps. Well done. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Until next time. Thank you so much for joining in. See you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.